Michael Jackson made over $2 billion over the course of his career and died dead broke. Actually, he died with $500 million in debt. How does that even happen? Time to think like an investor. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Josh and I am fascinated by the topics of investing and wealth management on all these sorts of things. And one of the things that is unbelievably pervasive in this world of money and finance is this idea of the hedonic treadmill. And you may have heard of it and you may have not, but it's essentially this concept that for people in general, it's human nature for the goalpost to just keep on moving. And for us, we set some expectation of what life could be, and over time we work and we achieve it. We're great achievers of things. But once we get there, we kind of start to twiddle our thumbs and wonder, what's next? And the finish line always gets further and further away, and we're never completely content with what we have. Take, for example, the king of pop, Michael Jackson, who I referenced earlier. He actually wasn't born particularly wealthy. He was born in a small town in Indiana, close to the 60s in that era, and by the time the 80s came around, when he was in his early to mid 20s, he started to reach massive mainstream acclaim for his music and his entertaining abilities, and went on to make hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of his career. And he went from somebody who came from a modest upbringing to massive success, and like many athletes and entertainers, the spending increased with it. The mansions, the massive vacations, the opulent lifestyle. Until one point in the early 2000s, a prosecutor claimed that Michael Jackson was spending 20 to $30 million more than he was earning every single year and was actually criticized of having a billionaire spending habits on a multimillionaire's budget. Now, at the time of his death, forensic accountants looked into the picture and estimated that he was still owing between 400 to $500 million. Now, that's absolutely obscene. How does someone get into that position? And I think that the hedonic treadmill provides a perfect example of what this means. Does it seem rational? Does it seem whatsoever reasonable that somebody who came from a modern upbringing would then come into money, you'd think that they would just kind of start to maybe hoard it and protect it. But no, it's the opposite because you achieve one goal and it's not enough and you achieve the next goal and it's not enough and you end up living this Dan Bilzerian lifestyle where you're hoping for something external to provide that happiness and fulfillment that you want to experience in life. Now, there's another aspect of the whole hedonic treadmill theme that is very social. And as humans, we like to compare ourselves. We love to compare ourselves to our neighbors, like this whole keeping up with the Joneses phenomenon. Your neighbor gets that really new nice car and your wife looks at you and is like, hey, honey, should we get a really nice new car too? And you're trying to keep up with each other and maybe even one up each other. And a great example of another celebrity who went from modest beginnings to massive wealth and back down to zero is Nicolas Cage. Who actually was betting against Leonardo DiCaprio to buy a dinosaur skull artifact and paid like $300,000 for an old artifact. And what that is, is it's just this social dynamic. It's trying to one up your competitors, trying to put yourself on a pedestal higher than somebody else. And that is absolutely detrimental to your finances because what the heck is anybody doing spending $300,000 on a dinosaur skull? Now, that's not where the problems ended. He also had like nine Rolls Royces that were all the same and 15 different mansions and he bought multiple boats and a private jet and all these sorts of things. But all of that lavish spending eventually culminated in him not really being able to afford his properties and he'd ended up being foreclosed on many of them. None of this to mention, he actually stole the Declaration of Independence. What? Now, these stories are not at all uncommon. You've heard about them all the time. In fact, Sports Illustrated reports that 78% of NFL players go bankrupt two years into retirement. That is astronomical. And I think it really says something about human nature. It shows us how the social games that we play and these temptations to continue to move that goalpost and move where the finish line is can actually end up in our financial demise. Now, it's obvious to see why getting the goalpost to stop moving is such a massive goal in personal finance. When we're investing or trying to increase our wealth, that is almost like priority number one. If we can stop increasing our lifestyle every time something good happens, we can actually get ahead. So this really got me thinking, okay, what would the difference be between someone who, you know, works to their 20s, gets to age 30, making let's say $75,000 a good wage, 
And from then on, they decide, okay, I'm done upgrading my lifestyle. I am only going to save my raises and bonuses from now on, and I'm okay living off of 75,000. Whatever else comes to me in the form of a raise or whatever, we're going to invest that at a rate of 8% and see where that gets me over the long term, as opposed to somebody who every single year, every time they get a raise, they actually spend it. They increase the amount of things they're buying. So I cracked open my fancy wealth management software that I use to build client projections and built the scenario out. Let's say we get a 1% raise every single year over and above inflation, okay? And we save it every single year versus somebody who just doesn't. They continue to upgrade their lifestyle. We find some wild things. Firstly, the person who stops moving the goalpost and saves every additional dollar ends up with $1.9 million more by the age of 65, whereas the other person who didn't save anything additional would have ended up with zero because they didn't save anything additional. But the person who puts that money away and keeps chugging along every time they get a raise ends up with nearly $2 million more at the end. Now you might be thinking, well, who really cares about getting all of this massive benefit way later in life at age 65? Well, I wanna show you a chart of how much more the person ends up with who decides to save instead of continue to spend. And what we find is that, you know, around 38 or the age of 40, let's say 10 years into this, they have $53,000 more. So it's not as if that benefit all just accrues later. You have a way less stressful life the whole way along. Okay, let's look at the age of 50. At age 50, you have $333,000 more than if you hadn't been saving. And at age 65, that's where we see the crazy numbers. We see that 1.9 million number come up. So all that being said, this advantage you get by not allowing that goalpost to keep moving is every additional year, your life becomes more and more stress-free. And what we ultimately find at the end in retirement is the person who saved every additional raise in dollar actually ended up making $70,000 every single year after tax and after inflation. That's what they had to spend versus the person who didn't, who only was able to live off of $27,000 in retirement. Now, I know what you might be thinking, Josh, this is entirely unrealistic. It's like I'm working, I'm getting raises. Don't I deserve to like reward myself a little bit? Don't I deserve to kind of get a nice car or upgrade the house a little bit? And I think there's an absolutely rational case to be made for that because to be honest, there's a chance that you die early. And if you don't enjoy any of that money or any of that labor, there's no point in really having it. So we have to always balance these things out. You can't be all save everything, save every raise, and you also can't blow all the money. Neither of those are rational. So I wanna think about what is the moral of the story here? The moral of the story is that yes, you're allowed to increase the goalpost, but you cannot increase it faster than your rate of savings. I think that is really something that I wish I could impress upon every single client I work with. And you know what, honestly, even myself and my own family, I wish I could make that concept clear to everybody. It's okay to increase your lifestyle. It's okay to spend a little more as you make a little more. You deserve it. But you cannot spend more than you increase your savings. The moral of the story is it's not the hedonic treadmill that's the problem. It's the investing that you sacrifice by doing so. If you can continue to increase your investment rate or your savings to your emergency fund faster than you can increase your spending, by all means, go ahead, upgrade your lifestyle, buy that new car, take that nice vacation.